Uh, I'd like to start with EPS's uh, land acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Colonialism is an ongoing process. We hope that this land acknowledgement statement encourages our EPS community to think about what it means to occupy space on indigenous lands, to address the intentional erasure of indigenous peoples, and to take real steps towards decolonizing land relations. Learning about Wisconsin First Nations is an essential step in this process, and we invite all of you to please explore some of the resources that are uh, in the, the link that Michael is putting into the um, chat right now. Having said that, uh, I'd like to, with great excitement, introduce you to today's speaker. We are really thrilled to have Dr. Noah Romero join us today um, as the second of this semester's um, speakers in the Indigenous Education Speakers Series. Dr. Romero is a decolonial theorist and a critical Indigenous Studies scholar educator. Bridging ethnic studies and education, his research examines how dispossessed and deterritorialized people redefine learning and identity in subcultural contexts, with a focus on Indigenous and immigrant communities in the US, New Zealand, the Philippines, and the Philippine diaspora. Dr. Romero is currently a postdoctoral scholar of educator preparation at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and we are just really thrilled and honored that he's joining us today. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Romero. Thank you so much, Professor Kendall. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, um, get after it, as they say in New Zealand. Um, so first things first, um, well, I am here to talk about decolonial underground pedagogy and some exciting subcultural um, community embedded futures and directions in indigenous and decolonizing education. Uh, but first things first, I want to um, situate and introduce myself. One second. There we are. All right, so kia ora tato, uh, ko ilokos te maunga, ko uh, abra te awa, um, ko narbakan iloko suur, um, I'm sorry, no narbakan iloko suur aho, ko te piripini toke turanga wai wai, uh, ko Romero Tokufano, ko Noa Toku Ingawa, Paka Fetai Kiyakoto, Moto Manaki, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Katoa. Uh, so, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name um, is Noah Romero, and I'm the postdoctoral scholar of educator preparation at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, and my PhD was in Maori and Indigenous Education from the University of Auckland in Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, or New Zealand, it's the Maori name for New Zealand. Um, I am joining you from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, which is the unceded land of uh, the Nuuvi or the Southern Paiute people uh, and the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. And uh, I just want to take a second to acknowledge their uh, elders, past, present, and emerging, um, and indigenous peoples um, throughout uh, throughout this land, specifically the the Great Basin Mojave region from. Uh, uh, on which I'm a guest currently. Um, and thank you as well to uh, to Michael and to, to Professor Kendall for uh, for hosting me and your graciousness and having me here today. Thank you all for being here again. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, today I'll be talking about decolonizing education, specifically this idea of decolonial underground pedagogy. And that refers to a theoretical framework uh, devoted to understanding the liberatory learning experiences that that are made possible in minority-led subcultural communities. Um, you know, the, the exigency of that work really comes from um, the sort of scholarship, research, uh, community-embedded activism I've been doing with Indigenous communities uh, in the Philippines, in Aotearoa, um, and here in the US on projects that are devoted to decolonizing education. 
Uh, and I define that uh, as an approach to teaching and learning that fosters healing, balance, connectedness, self-determination, the rematriation of stolen land, and the resurgence of indigenous lifeways upon those lands. Um, but there are also critical issues in indigenous education that cut across those contexts. Uh, and those include the disproportionate rates of attainment among indigenous students relative to white students in the US, the devaluing of indigenous identities and knowledge in school settings, uh, and the whitewashing of curriculum and pedagogy. So decolonizing uh, education is a project that is both prescient, it is of the moment, but it's also a project that will have no end. Uh, but it is important uh, to, uh, to try to do it here and now. Uh, decolonial under, uh, where decolonial underground pedagogy comes in is that it shows us that we don't need to start from scratch and we don't need to look far. Um, so the liberatory learning that occurs in subcultural communities led by indigenous and minoritized people um, give us examples of social groups that organize around interests or social groups that organize in pursuit of decolonizing education, even if the interests that um, those groups cohere around are deemed by mainstream society as frivolous at best or men menacing at worst. They allow um, they also allow young people to create educational opportunities uh, and pursue educational goals for themselves. So for that reason, uh, they have a lot to teach us about what it means to educate for ideas like social justice and anti-racism and equity and self-determination and liberation. Uh, so this, this work um, is coming out in a, new, in a book uh, called Decolonial Underground Pedagogy, and it'll come out this year. It's actually the manuscript is due in a week. So kind of sweating about that, um, but it's fine. Um, so in the next few um, minutes, and, I'm, and what I'm really looking forward to is the conversation that, that hopefully um, emerges out of this. But I want to foreground that in um, just some discussion of some of the studies that are in that book, uh, where I focus on three uh, subcultures that I participate in myself. And those are punk rock, skateboarding, uh, and the unschooling movement. Uh, but first, a little bit of wayfinding. Ultimately, decolonial underground pedagogy as it pertains to education is about encouraging all of us to, um, to walk toward elderhood, to become mentors, guides, and elders in our own communities. Uh, and part of the responsibility of an elder is to help you find your way. So to situate this um, talk, um, I'm invoking the spirit of Link Ray, who's a Shawnee musician, legendary guitarist who invented the power chord. Uh, he invented, um, as a result, as a result of doing that, uh, and basically created the foundational clay from which punk rock, heavy metal, all every other form of heavy guitar-based music um, came out of. So a lot of times, a lot of the a lot of the first questions I get when doing subcultural work is, is um, well, these are, well, how do you account for the fact that punk rock, skateboarding, these are, per, per, uh, these are white spaces, white interests? Well, you know, the thing is, like, Link Ray uh, invented it. So, <laughs> and because of that, uh, Indigenous and people, Black Indigenous person of color, uh, folks have influenced and shaped the direction of subculture from the beginning. Um, but yeah, how this talk will go is I'll first introduce you to uh, the roots of decolonial underground pedagogy, so the, the conceptual touchstones. Um, then we'll get into the water, which is the research questions. Um, uh, then the fish or the fish hooks or the method methodological strategies that make this inquiry possible. Uh, and then I'll, we'll get into the land elders and horizons. Those are the studies which show how subcultural learning can strengthen our relationships with our communities and reclaim ancestral knowledge. And then we'll get into some future projects and possibilities that build on those um, lines of inquiry and those studies um, to think about how we can pursue educational justice everywhere, uh, including in schools. 
So the root of this project is what I call a concentric model of Indigenous education, and that bridges seminal transnational literature on in Indigenous education and adds a fair bit of soy sauce, fish sauce, and garlic, a little bit of Philippine flavor. Uh, so it's inspired by, this model itself is inspired by uh, Indigenous Philippine tattoo uh, motifs. Um, and these designs in particular are, um, are sort of endemic to the Visayas region, uh, which is where my father's family is from, um, and is the region that Magellan first visited when he came upon the, the Philippine Islands. It's the first thing he saw when he met um, my ancestors. Um, so at the core, in the very middle of this circle, is, um, is a symbol. Um, it's, it's just a letter. It's the letter, uh, it's a symbol for the sound ka. Um, and oftentimes that letter is used to symbolize the concept of kapwa. And that is the philosophy in um, Philippine epistemology that the self is shared with all others. Uh, and that includes human and non-human others. It's in the middle because cultivating kapwa is, is the purpose of education. Uh, it's the recognition that, uh, it's the recognition of the interconnectedness of all beings. Uh, and that directly contests Western concepts of personhood that reduce us to separate self-interested atomized individuals in competition with one another over limited resources and dismisses children as unfinished human capital. Uh, Kapwa clarifies that we all, including the youngest and smallest of all of us, uh, are always and already complete. Uh, and since ourselves are shared, so are our responsibilities. Uh, the water that surrounds Kapwa, um, that's the second um, innermost circle there, uh, represents our questions. And that's the intrinsic drive that moves us to nourish our consciousness so we can live responsibly in community. The fish hooks, which are the third uh, circle, are the methods. And that is the bridging of new and ancestral knowledge to fish life out of those murky waters. Uh, the mountains of the fourth circle represents land in our communities and they remind us that learning is frivolous if we don't use our knowledge to serve our people and the earth uh, and the outer circle symbolizes our elders and ancestors whose watchful eyes hold the system in balance um, and i like to remind my teacher candidates that um, when you step into that role as an educator as an instructional leader um, you're part of that circle. You're part of that circle of elders and accordingly have a responsibility to keep the rest of it uh, in balance. Um, <clears throat> so in a school context, because um, that's where my research is, is sort of situated now, even though I've been doing all this out of school, uh, sort of sometimes, it's sometimes perceived as anti-school <laughs> research. It's not that. Uh, but in a school context, the, the concentric model shows that teachers have a responsibility to honor children in the fullness of their materiality while working with them to achieve their goals. Um, the thing is, if our elders, teachers, and leaders can't restore that balance, the other circles need to pick up the slack. Um, and that's what we've been asking the earth to do since 1492. It's what we ask students to do when our schools aren't here to serve them. So the water, the questions that frame this work uh, come from my own experiences in decolonizing education, which I really didn't learn in school. I learned the vocabulary in graduate school, but the concepts, the embodiment of it. Um, you know, I learned that at punk shows, I learned that by playing in bands, by skating, and by talking to people, talking to my elders, talking to my family and, and friends and my kids. Um, so the, the question that holds all this together is how did that happen uh, and why? Um, <clears throat> but in terms of drilling down into a research project, the questions that frame this uh, book are, um, what do subcultures offer people of color? Specifically, what do they offer minoritized youth um, that schools don't? Um, so how do they help us learn in ways that advance the political imperatives of decolonization? And how can those insights help all of us make education more equitable 
in other contexts, including in schools. So having done the PhD in New Zealand, I can't help but be incredibly um, influenced by Linda Tahiwai Smith and um, her writing around decolonizing methodology, specifically um, the concepts of community research, storytelling, and the close and critical rereading of texts, as well as uh, autoethnographic auto explorations of my own subjectivity, of my own reflections and memories and recollections. Um, but I also practice the indigenous Philippine methodology of pakapakapa, uh, which translates to feeling around in the dark. Um, and then there's also an offshoot of pakapakapa, which is pakapa ng ista, uh, feeling around for fish, fish being the metaphorized sort of new information we get out of being in community. Um, it's suppositionless research that calls us to immerse ourselves deeply in community, uh, community life before claiming knowledge or even asking questions about that community. Uh, and with that said, it's not a strategy for infiltrating a community. Instead, uh, suppositionless research, paka paka pa, feeling around in the dark, all of those things ask us to think deeply about our own communities and to use whatever tools are on hand to really come to know and embody the profound truths held within them. Uh, so before getting into the more visible subcultures like punk rock and skateboarding, I wanted to ground this talk in a, in a smaller story, um, which illustrates what decolonial underground pedagogy means to me specifically, hoping it, with hopes of building some relationality and conviviality with you all, uh, sharing a little bit uh, of me. Um, so I'll start by discussing my reflections on unschooling and what that means to me as a deterritorialized and dispossessed Philippine subject. Um, and what unschooling has done is it's shown me that decolonizing education isn't just a matter of curriculum or pedagogy or statements of intent or strategic goals. It's, a, it's something that has to extend into every aspect of someone's life. Um, and I need to jump around in the slides a little bit. Uh, but unschooling is what it sounds like. It's home education without curriculum or assessment. Uh, children are trusted to self-direct their learning. Unschooling parents serve as their mentors and guides. Uh, unschoolers are often critical of schools, identifying them as sites of oppression and control. And it's easy to dismiss that as cynicism um, in, your, in the vein of Ivan Illich or, or Henry Giroux. Those are certainly um, um, foundational literatures in unschooling. Um, but for Filipino people, that's also a historical fact. In 1898, the US purchased the role of colonizer from Spain and a cable from the White House decreed that the institution of a formal and compulsory education system was as necessary as an armed invasion to secure control over those islands. Uh, so American educators, brought, uh, American educators who were brought to the Philippines on a warship uh, wanted to install uh, what they called character in Philippine pupils. And that character centered six values that were thought to be completely foreign uh, to the Philippine psyche. And those were democracy, honesty, industry, thrift, sportsmanship, and patriotism. Uh, so for me, unschooling goes beyond a, you know, just a reactionary critique of school. It signifies the process of reclaiming stolen ancestral knowledge. And that includes being able to understand how our ancestors move through us. Um, so this sort of realization came about, as many realizations did, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so my partner, Amanda, she's the primary educator and caregiver in our family. And seeing her unschooling praxis as a decolonial pedagogy and through Philippine philosophy helped me really appreciate what, what she does. And what she does is an inheritance of the, of, of the Babaylan are healers, priestesses, ritualists, herbalists, and mediators between realms. Uh, in our family, Amanda is a healer and her authority comes from a really restorative, relational and life-giving source of power. Uh, her sensitivity and attunement to a more than human consciousness uh, helped restore my inner life 
after an especially harrowing experience, and that was the death of my grandmother. So to talk about her a little bit, most people knew my grandmother. She is third from, I'm sorry, third from the left, the third person in that, um, in this picture here. Uh, most people knew my grandmother as Mila del Sol. Uh, everyone in my family called her Lula, and that's a nickname she invented. It's a combination of the word Lola, which means grandmother in Tagalog, and the word Inai, which means mother. It's, uh, it's not a thing basically is what, what I'm trying to say. She made it up. Uh, <clears throat> from the 1930s to the 1950s, Lulai was an actress renowned for her graceful movements and bright expressions. Uh, her home was decorated with photos from her days as the queen of the golden age of Philippine cinema. And in those photos, she cut a reliably reg regal figure and wore gowns adorned with ornate butterfly sleeves. Uh, so when she died in November 2020, um, family members outside of the Philippines weren't able to travel there because of the pandemic. So we went to her funeral and her memorial services through, through Zoom, through video stream, like we're doing now. Uh, and in the days after her death, Amanda and I showed our kids, Leo and Rosie, clips of Lulai's films and told them about her life. Um, my grandmother started a janitorial services company after retiring from, from acting. Um, and that company ended up employing over 100,000 people over the preceding four decades. Uh, in those old movies, I could also see glimpses of decolonial healing mapped onto my grandmother's movements and her expressions. In her first film, we'll watch a clip of in a second. Uh, in her first film called Giliuko, she plays a girl from the province who's brought to Manila to perform for U.S. soldiers and the political establishment. She refuses to sing in English and at the end of the movie returns home to sing the songs of her people. Uh, and after Lulai's passing, after my grandmother's passing, Amanda noticed that her expressions and my daughter's expressions were identical and that monarch butterflies seemed to follow us wherever we went. So with that realization, the grief gave way to gratitude and hope. Um, and I found solace in the feeling that uh, my grandmother managed to wish us well before the next leg of her journey. Amanda's observations reminded me that she lives on, my grandmother lives on through her descendants, her art, her legacy of service. And I owe that knowing to my partner who cultivates a joyful vitality by communing with her surroundings um, by communing with the spirit world and our interconnected humanity. So my grandmother wouldn't let me, she would never let me get into all that without um, being able to weigh in her, herself. Uh, so here is a clip uh, from Giliuko, where again, she is being asked to sing in English um, and doesn't want to. Uh, and as a, and in doing so, and, and being forced into a sort of, um, colonial power relationship manages to find ways to resist from within that dynamic. So it's the, the resistance isn't so much um, overt and external, but it's in the little sideways glances, little hair flicks, little um, distortions of pronunciation and enunciation that sort of change the meaning of the words she's saying. Um, and sort of let us know that, um, that that ancestral knowing is still there, even though it is under threat. So without further ado. Okay. Ah, huwag kang malungkot. Ayam mo't ayusin ko aking radyong kawayan ng pagkanta mo sa Maynila, ay palagi akong makikinig parang ikaw ay nasa feeling ko. Talaga ba? Gagawin mo yan? Oo, ipinangangako ko. At sabi na senyorito, Kantahin mo kagaya ng dati. Bakit niya ko pinipilit pa kasi ng English? Sinabi ko na sa inyo hindi ako maari. Bakit din niya ko pagsahin ng Tagalog? 
Mila del Sol, everyone. Let's jam through this next bit. Um, all right. So get from that sort of foundation that um, subcultural life can help us realize our interconnected relation, interconnected and contingent relationality that connects us to each other, uh, to the land, to our ancestors. That is sort of the foundation of my sort of um, entreaties into, into the punk scene. Um, so the mountains in that concentric model, they represent land or the idea that decolonizing education is, a decolonizing education is one that serves a greater interconnected collective whole. Um, and that really underpins the sort of writing I've done around punk rock pedagogy, or that that refers to the educative uh, dimensions of punk subculture. And those cons that consists of three pillars. The first pillar of punk rock pedagogy is reflection or critical thinking about the material conditions of oppression. The second is the use of punk music and its aesthetic forms, you know, a loud, controversial um, clothing and um, album art, things like that. Uh, the use of punk music and culture as a means of processing those historicized reflections. And the third is praxis, concrete action uh, that emerges out of that um, thinking, uh, undertaken in solidarity with minoritized and marginalized people. Um, so punk rock pedagogy underpins my studies on resurgent audiovisual sovereignty, aesthetic sovereignty, and altero that's a fancy term for the work of Maori or indigenous punks. Um, and those are, these are artists who are equally punk and equally indigenous. And their music confronts the ongoing legacies of genocide, dispossession, and colonial miseducation in New Zealand. Uh, so the case in point is my friend Waidahu Grant. Um, and despite New Zealand being heralded as a world leader in indigenous rights, uh, Māori still faced entrenched discrimination in all aspects of New Zealand society. Māori com uh, comprised 53% uh, of the prisoner population, the incarcerated population, despite being only 16% of the general population. And that's linked to a long history of institutional racism, dispossession, and the suppression of Māori language and its customs. Um, so Waida, who uses punk music to critique and dismiss those standard stories that equate indigenous bodies with cr criminality and indigenous knowledge with lack. So his song, Fakamarama, is inspired by haka, you know, the ceremonial dance accompanied by chanting that's popularly associated with combat, but is more accurately, accurately described as an in invitation to engage. Uh, so in that song, when Waida, who says, uh, he's, he's saying, explain me to myself. It's an invitation to the colonial schoolmaster uh, to tell him who he is. 
winking that he knows that colonial systems will never fully understand the deep kinship ties that bind him to the land and to his ancestors unless they're willing to listen. The thing is, punk rock pedagogy doesn't end with making music. The experiential knowledge scales upward and radiates outward in infinite directions. Um, Maori punks, like Waira, who in engage in direct action and activism on behalf of their communities. Uh, for him, that means organizing benefit concerts for, for fellow punks experiencing health issues or financial hardship. And he's currently planning a tour of Wales and England, which I suggested he called the Doctrine of Discovery Revenge Tour as his walk to elderhood through punk has gifted him with mana or the authority to know that he is now the knowledge bearer and the author of his destiny. So punk rock pedagogy proved foundational to my work around skate pedagogy or the educative dimensions of skateboarding. Skate pedagogy also involves a physical education that cultivates an understanding of how we and our environments are interconnected. And that education is unlocked by the skateboard itself. Uh, skateboarding transforms the relationships between ourselves and our environment, illustrating the infinite capacities of both. You know, on two feet, a handrail is just a handrail. Uh, but on a skateboard, it's something else entirely. Uh, it's, it's Mount Everest. It, is, um, it represents hours and months and years of sustained, grueling work to be in relationship with that handrail, uh, potentially. Uh, you know, on two feet, a pebble is insignificant. On a skateboard, it's the most powerful thing in the world. It can stop your wheels on a dime and send you teeth first into the concrete. Any skater has to respect the land they're skating on. Thinking about the ontological significance of native skaters skating on native land gives us new lenses for understanding ideas like sovereignty and perpetuity. Uh, so that idea led me to Apache Skateboards and its co-founders, Doug Miles and Doug Miles Jr. Uh, Apache Skateboards started in 2001. Uh, when Doug Sr. was already a renowned artist, he, uh, he painted a skateboard with an Apache warrior on it for his son, Doug Jr. Uh, he's, he's quoted in USA Today, uh, not you, the Today Show. Today Show profiled Apache Skateboards. And he said that if it was 100 years ago, he would have made his son a bow and arrow. But since it's today, he made him a skateboard. That is what he needed and wanted. Uh, since then, he's, uh, they've been working together nonstop to increase indigenous representation in skateboarding. And Doug Jr. has grown into a professional skater. And he has a deeply ethical understanding of his roles as a community leader. He's hard at work on the Apache Passion Project, which is a grassroots initiative to build skate parks on reservations throughout Turtle Island. Uh, Miles uh, recognizes that the skate park's communal functions go beyond skate skateboarding. They offer Native youth opportunities to hone their craft as photographers, videographers, musicians, artists, cooks advancing the goals of tribal sovereignty and well-being by cultivating young people's creative, social, and professional aspirations as they have defined them for themselves. So Doug uh, Sr. beams when he calls his son the hardest working skater in the world. They keep building skate parks. The project is also helping to redefine DIY. Uh, it still means do it yourself, but it now has a deeper significance to defend indigenous youth. Uh, with skateboarding at the center of their art and activism, Apache Skateboards continues to help people become aware that native art is a living tradition and that the Apache nation is not only still here, it will live forever. So in thinking about where this research is headed, I note that decolonial underground pedagogy is only the beginning. It's already grown beyond studies of subculture. It informs my work with the Center of Indigenous Peoples Education in the Philippines. And there I'm working with Indigenous students and teachers to demonstrate the necessity of, an, uh, of educational models that go beyond the Philippine state's narrow and technocratic definitions of development and progress. Uh, and those questions frame my, the work I'm doing now with the Nevada Educator Preparation Institute and Collaborative and there I'm leading projects dedicated to implementing next generation practices in teacher recruitment, preparation and retention. And for me, 
that's involved teaching courses and introducing pre-service teachers to decolonial and decolonizing education while helping them work through how they would cultivate reciprocal and respectful communities in their own classrooms. One of my students shared with me that she developed a lesson plan on the invasion and colonization of the Americas for fourth graders. And she did that for two reasons. The first is that the students were encountering more critical perspectives outside of school and demanded to explore them in class. And the second is that she felt an obligation to tell them the truth. So in this case, decolonial underground pedagogy's tenets of relationality, informal learning, and the radical agency involved in subcultural identity management have been useful in interrogating discourses around what makes a good teacher. Um, but we're in, obviously, we're in a context, an overarching milieu where organized attacks on indigenous education, multicultural education, ethnic studies, comprehensive sexuality education, queer theory, critical race theory, you know, the few avenues that allow minoritized students to engage in the tenuous exercise of freedom. We're schooling and learning in that environment makes it so that um, our youth might only encounter holistic and healing forms of education in subculture, it might be the only place where they're able to um, exercise and iterate um, their sovereignty. So how do we practice insurgent, emergent, and resurgent pedagogies of sovereignty in our classrooms? Uh, by uplifting the ways racialized and minoritized people, young people in particular, are actuating forms of teaching and learning that engender justice and healing for themselves, decolonial underground pedagogy might, to paraphrase Savannah Shange, inspire collective rather than corrective action and help us build pathways instead of pipelines. So to this end, I invoke the words of Rewi Maniapoto, a Maori uh, Ariki or chief, who's one of Wairahu's ancestors who now speaks through him. Uh, after being surrounded by British soldiers at the fortress uh, in Oraco in 1864, a colonial emissary approached Rewi to negotiate the terms of a surrender. And to this, he responded, Ehoa, e kaore mate rongo, ka fa fai tonumato, mo te ake, mo ake, ake. When it comes to ensuring educational justice and equity for our youth, there will be no surrender, and we will fight forever and ever and ever. Thank you. That's my information. Feel, please feel free to tap in. I would love to hear from you. And... Um, Happy to open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Romero. Um, everyone, you can either use the uh, Q&A function um, to ask your questions, or I'm about to open up the chat, and you can post your questions in the chat. Give me one moment. Right. Uh, we have the first one from Tabitha Faber. Um, Thank you for your talk. Would you be willing to share names of Maori punk artists or even playlists of songs? Yes, absolutely. And uh, yes, if uh, if we're waiting for for questions to come in, I'm happy to to just shout shout them out. Um, I can put them in the chat as well. But there is my favorite band, the White Who Side. So White Who's band is called Halftime. That is uh, that is on Spotify. It's half. Uh, slash time. Um, and yeah, they're currently on tour in the UK. So if you stream their songs, you get, they'll get that um, one one hundredth of a penny, everything, <laughs> everything counts. You can do something you can do is put uh, your favorite bands, uh, just put them on repeat with the volume all the way down uh, and just just play it while um, while you go to bed. Uh, they get money from that. Uh, so halftime is one. Uh, darts is another. D a r t z. Um, they're they're kind of a more like a party punk band, but they uh, they sort of uh, hide all of the sort of decolonial um, discourse within the within this uh, party fun atmosphere. Uh, darts is really cool. There's another one called D a h t m. Uh, that is um, 
that is fronted by Sasha Lee Douglas, who's sort of a pillar of Maori punk. Um, D-A-H-T-M, I believe they're on Bandcamp. Uh, that stands for uh, Death and Hatred to Mankind. Um, it's uh, pretty awesome. I don't know. I feel like if you if you go to New Zealand, you realize that naming your band Death and Hatred to Mankind is is like funny. It's coming from a place of of humor rather than being serious about that. Uh, so yeah, darts, halftime, D-A-H-T-M. Um, there's some wonderful um, uh, indigenous punk and metal bands right here in uh, on Turtle Island. I've been uh, just wrote a, a chapter uh, theorizing the work of the band MIS as a as a decolonial underground pedagogy. Um, MIS, so M dot I dot S. It stands for Merciless Indian Savages, which is a borrowed from a passage in the Declaration of Independence. Um, their first single is called Kill the Man, Save the Indian. Um, and that is a, it's really a, a really wonderful case study of uh, indigenous resistance and in education. Um, so as educational scholars, definitely recommend uh, y'all checking that out. Um, from Amian, uh, thanks for this presentation. Where do you see the kids you work with going in the future? Will they stay in the Philippines? Will they join the diaspora? Um, will they attend traditional uh, colleges? Um, and sorry, I have a uh, interesting side note. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what's up. Um, that sounds good. I might have adobo for lunch today too. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, um, yeah, I, I, if you're referring to the youth at the Center for Indigenous Peoples Education in the Philippines, overarchingly, um, those students want to stay in the Philippines and, uh, and to continue living in, um, on their ancestral land, tribal areas in the Philippines. The problem is, um, given the, the tensional interplay between Indigenous sovereignty and the state, you know, they, they, don't always have complete control over that that sort of um, decision. Uh, indigenous areas in the Philippines are some of the most. I'm sorry, indigenous communities in the Philippines are some of the most targeted communities in the world. Um, they're constantly under threat of uh, under threat from state violence and development aggression. There's always gold mining and damming. Um, projects sort of encroaching on indigenous land. Um, and for that reason, it's important that folks from everywhere engage in transnational movement building to protect indigenous sovereignty and self-determination uh, in a variety of contexts. Uh, it certainly looks a certain, it, it, the particularities of indigenous struggle look different across colonial terrains, but beyond the surface, they're not that different. You know, the, the things that are happening in Northern Nevada, for example, where um, Pyramid Lake Paiute uh, land is, is sort of under attack by uh, lithium mining operations, um, have a lot of consonances with what's happening in the Philippines. So um, yeah, always, I usually use this more as a, as a teaching tool, but uh, this works for social movements and organizing as well is that it's incumbent on all of us to um, tap in, strap in, and make it happen. You know, get in with folks everywhere, uh, learn, listen and learn from what their struggles are, and figure out, figure out what our responsibilities are for, um, for advancing them, uh, no matter where, where we're sort of beaming in from. Uh, all these questions are piling. Oh, let me make my answers a little more concise going forward. It's all good. Um, Dr. Kendall, do you want to read yours or do you want me to read? I, I will I will come off mic happily because I never write these questions the way I mean them. It sounds very binary the way I set it up, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit about you're working across formal spaces, formal schooling spaces, um, and and much more, well, I would say much more liberatory educational spaces. And I'm wondering how you think about where we should put our energy uh, in where kids are going to 
have certain kinds of experiences. I'm speaking mostly from the sex education work I've done. And over the years, I've come to feel more and more that um, because of the way schools are structured and the way that the legal system works in the US, we're not going to be able to get very far in a lot of schools. And so it's not that that battle isn't important. It's not that we don't need to continue it, but it's a battle that probably can't happen at the classroom or school level right now. It really needs to happen at the legislative uh, level because people don't feel protected enough uh, to otherwise kind of um, create a more liberatory space. And so then the question is where, where do and where should and where can kids go to have a really different kind of sex education experience. So in my mind, I've started to feel more and more like these things need to be divided up and the ways that we think about where to fight and how to fight might be shifting quite radically. I was just wondering how, you know, if you could reflect a little bit on your thoughts working across these different systems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a big one. That's heavier. <laughs> um, sharing from a, a teacher ed perspective, I guess is that there is a lot, there is a great deal of, of power um, and influence to be found in, I guess uh, this is like kind of dry, but, <laughs> but there is a lot to be said for, for boosting teacher self-efficacy and teaching teachers to sort of embody those critical decolonial and uh, community responsive and um and just sort of courageous it's kind of like a punk sort of <laughs> posturing and ontology there's a great deal to be gained from encouraging teachers to not give i, I don't know what the culture is like in wisconsin but at, at, at uw but um so apologies uh, pardon my french here <laughs> there's a lot to be gained from teaching teachers to not give a fuck about telling kids the truth um, because ultimately that is what using a using that going back to that concentric model that is what the, the teacher's responsibility is of course there's tensions folks need to worry about getting angry parents at their at their door getting hassled by a principal who doesn't share a similarly critical and decolonial ethic of care um, but to start with the teacher and to be like, if there is value in um, in teaching in ways that are liberatory, in teaching in ways that don't um, pathologize children as um, unable to grasp complex concepts like uh, consent and self determination, and the the idea that you as a child are able to uh, define and direct your own education. I just think that. The, getting um uh, you know it's kind of sidestepping like content there is uh, a lot to say a lot to be said for a moral education a moral teacher training that um that encourages them to be truthful with their students um the problem is i have a lot of teachers who who do that we're in classrooms now and are are talking about you know students are are touching each other in ways that uh, are not consensual. So I have to step in and say something and, and teach them. Uh, but then a principal comes in and says that, oh, that's not appropriate. I've got a parent complaining. So I think that's where like the teacher education and the educational leadership programs have to be similarly critical and decolonial so that everyone is on the same page that we're trying to build this world. Um, going to like Frank Wilderson, we're trying to destroy the old world that is built on these inequities, that is built on these pathologized hierarchies of difference. And we're trying to build something new and we need to get everyone on board on that. Um, so I think the College of Education does have a big role to play in actuating something like that. Obviously, it's not going to be um, immediate, but um, I don't know. I think the, the conversations I've had with teachers, uh, I'm I'm optimistic. I think it's possible. <laughs> so uh, I, I see you. Yeah, yeah, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, I I'll allow you to mute. Uh, hey Noah, great to see you. A wonderful talk, very generative. Um, I really am still reflecting on and processing it, but. Something that I saw in the beginning and I heard you mention uh, was 
it sounded to me like a sort of like an educational ontology. You said the child as untapped for uh, the capital, or you said something like accumulating capital, the potential to accumulate capital, and that that is the role of the child in education or traditional conventional education. Can you talk a little bit more about where you're tracing that argument from and sort of uh, the family of scholarship that you might you might lend towards that? Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Jacques. Um, I need to tap in with you more after this, by the way. <laughs> uh, it is good to see you. Um, yeah, so, I, I, yeah, obviously there is, you can trace that back to, I don't know, Rousseau or any number of dead white men the, that are sort of um, pathologizing and rendering children as unfinished tabula rasa or whatever. Um, an indigenous perspective of childhood, and I guess I'm thinking of folks like Gregory Cahetti, um, my dear friend Sandra Yellowhorse, an indigenous education perspective of childhood is that children are already complete. They are not in need of finishing or um, or of processing or what have you. They're simply in need of um, guidance. They have questions that they want answered that come from within their or come from within their um, subjectivity, but also come from without through um, through their moves and engagements in community. And the role of a, an educator, of an elder, is to help them get there. Is to help them figure out what what to make of of the questions swirling around in their head, so that they can one day not one day, but so that they can navigate that circle for themselves and join that outer circle of elders um, who have authority and trust and, and positions of responsibility within the community. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I, I, I always think back of um, my first semester teaching, I inherited a syllabus um, on multicultural education. There's a passage in there that was like, teachers are important because we help children become full human beings. And that just sort of, that, that just sort of wrinkled, stirred something up in my, <laughs> in my soul. I felt that there's something fundamentally um, colonial about that sort of thinking. Um, so it got me thinking of what, it, what does multicultural education look like when we understand that the children, no matter how young they are, step into those, um, step into those spaces as always already complete. And our role as educators is to help them achieve their goals, simple as that. Um, so that has sort of helped, um, helped me think about just the infinite power that, uh, that young people hold, that children hold, even the youngest of them. And I always say, if, we, if you forget that, um, if you lose sight of that, just remember that kids can see up your nose and uh, and give them the respect they deserve. I'm going to jump back in then, Noah, if that's OK, and okay. ask you if you could reflect a little bit more on the teacher education aspect of your work and talk a little bit about what you feel like um, you have found teachers most need from you as, as a mentor and guide right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's not a lot. I'm, I'm fortunate to be working on a project that is, um, it's, it's quite innovative in a regard, in, in the sense that it came about at a time where um, there was emergency funding available, right, because of the pandemic. Um, and the teacher shortage in Southern Nevada is, all, is kind of a perpetual emergency. Uh, so we're really, what we're really trying to do is come up with innovative ways to um, recruit and prepare and retain teachers uh, without the sort of bureaucracy and with sort of without, I don't know, the, the emergency, the pandemic created this um, environment where people were willing to put aside their sort of ideologies, their sort of conventional wisdom around what teacher preparation is supposed to look like and, and involve. Uh, so that made it so that, um, one, we've got these cohorts of, uh, uh, the cohort is up to 100 teacher candidates now who are, um, 
who are finishing within one year um, with a, a license and oftentimes a job. Uh, and in doing that, uh, again, the emergency made it so that they're fully funded and being able to do that. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm observing this situation where folks' financial needs, at least as far as their uh, educational and professional goals, the financial aspect of it is taken care of. Um, the courses are asynchronous and flexible, so the temporal needs are, are taken care of. Um, and um, decoloniality, indigenous education, multicultural education is built into the curriculum. So has being able to engage with knowledge that is relevant to the knowledge that they're bringing in as, as whole human beings, they're encountering that in teacher preparation as well. Um, so I guess what I'm seeing is that's what, um, that's what all teacher preparation should look like, but we're not gonna be in a, uh, flush with COVID funding forever. Um, so those conditions, those idealized conditions are um, not sustainable. Um, so I guess there will be a time where, um, where teacher ed will go back to its sort of tradition, what it traditionally looks like, and as a result will serve the folks that it traditionally serves, who, um, don't always look like or understand the young people of Southern Nevada, right? Which is a 70% um, black and brown uh, population in the schools. Um, so yeah, for me, it's kind of like, uh, the answer is that every teacher preparation program should be free. It should be flexible. It should be accelerated so that we can address these endemic issues in education. But I, what I'm seeing is it's not, it's not gonna be like that. Uh, the funding for this program runs out in 2024. So what do we do after 2024? And that's where I guess we have to sort of peel back the layers and drill, drill back and find a um, something beyond the sort of, um, or something beneath, what, what is it that, um, what is the sort of ethical and moral core of that generative work? Um, and I guess that's where a, a, a recentering of ancestral, indigenous, holistic, and relational knowledge comes in. So we're not going to be able to fund everybody forever, but if we go into um, preparing them to be in the classroom as mentors, guides, as elders, as folks with, um, I guess, use the Levin Levinasian term, who have an anarchic responsibility, folks who have um, folks who understand that their work is centered around serving the community, serving the youth above anything else, above um, teaching them specific uh, content knowledge, um, around position, uh, above position, positioning them to achieve whatever markers of uh, capitalistic success. If, if teachers understand that their responsibility is to um, walk into elderhood, then I think that sort of ethic of care will transcend whatever material limitations um, are placed on, on our subjectivities. So I guess that's where the, uh, that's where philosophy comes in. And it's important to uh, keep, uh, keep an eye on uh, ways of knowing that are just kind, kinder and more just, even if the particularities of what we're doing they're always going to change. There's always going to be limitations, but if we don't forget about that anarchic responsibility, I think it could go a long way. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, Dr. Romero. I'd like to invite everyone to thank Dr. Romero with me. Yeah. Um, we hope to continue this conversation in yes. ways over the years to come. Absolutely. Yeah, please don't hesitate to... Uh, to drop me a line to tap in. I'm happy to, um, yeah, to happy to just keep the conversation going. Thank you all again for uh, spending your um, lunch hour with me. I, it's, it's not lost on me, uh, the sacrifice involved in that. And I really do appreciate it.